نحم تو نسلی علیہ رسول الکریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اینڈ ویلکم ونس اگین ٹو بزنس میٹرس منڈے ایوننگ از دی نائٹ فار بزنس میٹرس یو ود می انور ملا اینڈ فار دا نیکسٹ تھرٹی فائیو منٹس اور سو آل بی ود مائی اسٹوڈیو گیسٹ ڈسکسنگ دی بزنس آف دا ڈے Um, my studio guest tonight is a person that's very well known to Radio Al-Ansar, a person who's deeply involved with the Minara Chamber of Commerce, and he is Mr. Ibrahim Patel. Ibrahim, assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Business Matters Program. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and shukran for having me here with you this evening. Okay. How's things going at the Minara? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. The, the Chamber is progressing and as you know, we have our Business Recognition Awards that are currently in the nomination phase where people can nominate uh, uh, friends and uh, uh, other uh, colleagues to to uh, participate in the uh, Minara Recognition Awards. And if, you know, listeners out there want to nominate a good business or a business professional uh, to be part of the uh, the uh, Chiva Awards, and it's the opportunity at the moment. Yes, I attended last year's function at the um, Coastlands um, uh, um, Hotel, a uh, very elaborate function and some you know really worthy winners that were there and every year the functions just get better and better and uh, the type of people that are nominated are really you know uh, wonderful to sometimes it's nice to recognize people in in that they're you know, quietly carrying on their own in, in their own kind of in their own little way but uh, to recognize these people for what they do for our community we need to recognize uh, people who are playing exceptional roles in both in business and the community yes. and it's a source of encouragement as well mm-hmm. that you know if i can see someone is progressing it becomes an encouragement for me and for the rest of the community that you know we can start emulating that progress as well absolutely so well, well done to to yourself and the uh, Minara ba- Chamber of Commerce for sure. kind of taking the initi- initiative for doing this. And I know it started from uh, very small beginnings, but it's really grown. And, uh, Alhamdulillah. So, uh, and through the uh, support of people like yourself, who have always encouraged us over the years. Yeah. Anyhow, um, as you would have gathered, this program is brought to you by the Minara Chamber of Business, so um, B- Minara Chamber of Commerce. And uh, tonight we have Ibrahim here. But Ibrahim sits here with a different cap on this evening, not from the Minara, so to speak, but as, a, as the Honorary Consul General for the country of, of Indonesia. Ibrahim, uh, tell us, how did this come about? How many years have you been the on, uh, Honorary Consul General for KZN to the country of Indonesia? So, uh, Anwar, the uh, Honorary Consul of the Republic of Indonesia in KZN is the representative of the President and the Government of Indonesia in KZN. Okay. Um, I was appointed to that role in 2020, and it came about after uh, submission by uh, President Jokowi, uh, President of Indonesia, who selected myself as the representative for the government in KZN, and it was endorsed by our president, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, and Naledi Pando at Derko. Okay. And uh, how how did that actually happen? You obviously would have been to Indi- Indonesia on many occasions. Would have it has come through, you know, the many visits I've had to Indonesia, but also the close relationship that I've enjoyed with both the Indonesian business sector and the government sector. And Indonesia has, as you know, an ambassador based in Pretoria who looks after the affairs of the Indonesian government in Pretoria, but they needed a representative in KZN. And the reason they re- needed the representative in KZN is because of the growing number of business investments taking place in KZN by Indonesian businesses, number one. And number two, the growing number of people of Indonesian origin that pass through the port of Durban. So we know that in the maritime industry that there are a number of Indonesian sailors that are on board uh, the vessels that come through the port of Durban, and obviously they require consular services. But there's there's two reasons for the uh, for the appointment uh, in KZN. One is to grow the trade between the province of KZN and Indonesia because we enjoy the same strategic uh, kind of outlook in that uh, KZN, uh, the port of Durban being a port city, large number of goods that are coming in from the from the east and various parts of the of the world pass through the port of Durban into sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and then the, the long-standing relationship the political and historical and cultural relationship between the countries. So to strengthen and enhance both those two pillars. Yeah, we've, we've always uh, known of, of Indonesia as being the, the country with the world's largest Muslim population. Um, I think you can verify that. But interestingly, 
uh, it's the world's fourth most populous country. So we know China and India would be the the, the, the top two. I'm not sure which is the third one. The, the US, the, yeah. The, would it be the USA? With the US, yeah. And, uh, and, and Indonesia <coughs> is the world's most populous country with 280 million people. So that's a massive country and a lot of people. Well, it's interesting. It's, it's 280 million people, but 1,300 uh, different ethnic groups wow. speaking 700 li- languages spread over 17,000 islands. Wow. Now, imagine the, the uh, administrative nightmare of governing that kind of diversity. Uh, and that speaks to the volume of the way the Indonesians run the country, uh, the way the government operates, and the way the people themselves are. And, you know, we, you know, we always spoke about in South Africa uh, diversity through unity. Right. And, and it's actually a pillar of Indonesian society, not from now, from many years back, that uh, recognizing the diversity of 13, you know, 1,300 different ethnic groups and uh, bringing everyone together. So everyone has come around a common pillar, and that is that Indonesia comes first. Okay. Wow. Um, so you, you mentioned something about so many thousand different islands. I mean... Uh so how do how do people get around? It's, uh, well, it's, there's 17,000 islands that make up the country of Indonesia, and as you know, Indonesia is spread across a vast part of South the South uh, East Asia uh, Sea, the the South China Sea, uh, spanning from the Indian Ocean all the way through to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the the government is concentrated, so the majority of the people are on the island of Java, which is where Jakarta is located, the capital right. city. Uh, so bulk of the population lives in the in the island of Java. Uh, the rest of the islands are smaller islands. Of, mm-hmm. So of the seventeen thousand, there's only close on to seven thousand of them that are populated. You know. Uh, uh, densely populated. The rest are very sparsely populated or uninhabited. Um, but it spans across a huge section. So all the way from, you know, if we if we look at the map, it's it's coming off from Malaysia, past Singapore, all the way down through to the tip of India, of Australia. Okay. Wow. Well, I remember going there uh, to Indonesia a few years back myself on a bus- business kind of um, exploration, uh, looking at uh, at the. The formal way, men's formal way industry, and I ended up in a in a city called Bandung. Bandung, yeah, which is not far from uh, from Jakarta. It was a, a drive away, I think, about a two or three hour drive away. But what struck me at the time is, and there were some beautiful production facilities. In fact, we ended up buying quite a few, t- you know, a few thousand shirts from there, and also some suits. Um, what struck me at the time was most of the industry was being controlled by the the non-Muslim. Chinese people. I don't know if that has changed uh, recently, but it, it kind of stood out as if the, the the Muslim population, unfortunately, was more the the kind of uh, the working class, the lower rank type of people, and the industry or commerce was being controlled very much by the so called Chinese people of the of the of the place. <clears throat> well, it's similar to what happens in the rest of Southeast Asia. So, if we look at Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, bulk of it is uh, controlled by Chinese businesses, right. and the Chinese businesses have been large businesses. And obviously, a lot of those Chinese businesses have historical links with mainland China as well. Right. So, if we look at uh, a curious uh, scenario, is that Indonesia has become the largest producer of palm oil in the world. South Africa imports bulk of its palm oil, which is used in the cooking oil industry, from Indonesia. We've moved across from Malaysia. And that is because a lot of the the plantations from Malaysia have moved to Indonesia. But those plantations are, are all owned by Chinese. Right. So... Uh, it's the it's the it's the investment that has taken place in the region is mainly driven by Chinese who have invested into these facilities, but Indonesia has advanced beyond that. So if we look at the economy of Indonesia, whilst you saw these large factories that are controlled by Chinese, bulk of Indonesia's export market is actually driven by SMEs, which is one small little businesses located in rural villages who contribute to more than 47% of Indonesian exports that take place. You know, a very uh, interesting uh, example would be I met a lady in Sarawak who, um, um, sorry, in in Surabaya, uh, who buys crocodile skin from South Africa. In her home, in a small little village, she turns that crocodile skin into high-fashion leather handbags which are sold in Italy. Wow, 
Okay. And she's exporting a large amount of these handbags to Italy, buying the crocodile skin from South, from Africa. South Africa. And she makes this in her home. It's a small little home industry. Right. Uh, it's herself and her kids that are running this business. So imagine the, the kind of uh, innovativeness that has been brought into the, the Indonesian economy. You spoke about Bandung, and a very interesting historical fact that links South Africa with Bandung is the Bandung Conference that took place in the 1940s, which is the fir- sorry, in the 1950s, which is where Indonesia actually recognized that South Africa was an apartheid state. Okay. And it supported the fight for liberation in South Africa from the Bandung Conference. Okay. So there's a historical link between South Africa wow. and Bandung. Okay, I must relate a, a bit of a funny story about Bandung to you. The day I went to Bandung, I spent two days in Bandung <coughs> uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a very big industrial area and uh, there were a lot of uh, manufacturers that I had to visit there. So I ended up at a, at a suit manufacturing plant on a Friday morning and uh, spending a few hours there going through the, the, the factory and looking at the, the techni- technical expertise they had and whatever. So I said to management, which is all Chinese, that I'm Muslim and I, and I want to go to, to read uh, Juma Salah at, uh, at a mosque or whatever. So they said, look, there's no need to because at the factory itself, they oh. have these you know, quite big prayer areas yes. and they said they will be Saras. they will be they will be uh, uh, Juma taking place there and whatever so I said look at the appropriate time just tell me and then I'll go there and, and, and read my Salah so I ended up uh, going and being now part of the entire factory staff which is all Muslim uh, at the Juma and I stood out like a sore thumb <laughs> as an Indian from South Africa now in the midst of all of these uh, Indonesians and the imam comes up to me and says, I need to now give the Juma uh, lecture. <laughs> <laughs> totally unprepared. <laughs> so I, I had to do that and he translated into the local language. But it was uh, quite a funny story when I related it after that. And, as me and, standing and, up there. and we're knowing your depth of knowledge, I'm certain that you made a fantastic <laughs> lecture that day. Well, what I tried to encourage them in the lecture really was to say to them, uplift yourselves. Yeah. Because it seemed like they were all resigned to being just medium... Uh, factory workers and they all came to work on the back of a motorbike you, you found you, there were like 2,000 motorbikes parked out there and I wondered how each one recognized which was their own when we went home at the end of the day and they all just accepted their lot in life and were just kind of working and earning a, me, a, me, a kind of meager salary at the end of the day and I tried to encourage them to say you know what Uplift yourself, become the owners of businesses rather than just resigning yourself to being a worker for the rest of your life. It's, it's a culture of Indonesia. So through my, my, my numerous visits into Indonesia and my uh, relationship with, the, with Indonesians, uh, it's the culture of Indonesians. They're very, very humble, yes. kind, very uh, soft people. They're not aggressive. Uh, they don't have this this innate desire to be driving themselves. Um, what they believe in is that you have been given certain things, you have uh, uh, certain b- basic necessities that are met, and you live for that. Okay. Uh, so they have a very altruistic outlook uh, to life. You know, very uh, very um, un. How would I put it? Is a is a is they, they're not part of the rush. Okay. They don't want to be part of the rush. Okay. Okay, so but having but having but having said that, yeah. if you go into Jakarta, yeah. it's totally different. Jakarta, being a cosmopolitan city, yes. uh, it's it's a, you know traffic is a is a huge nightmare in Jakarta. Yes, it is. Um, you know the population of Jakarta increases by six million people every day. So six million people travel daily from outside of Jakarta into, into Jakarta. Right. Imagine moving the entire population of KZN into Durban every morning. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you've got six to seven million people that, have been, that are transported every day uh, coming into Jakarta, doing their work. The, 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 uh, the traffic on the major highways is now two, three-hour uh, delays. So, so much so that the government is now moving the entire administrative and, and the capital city will be moved to a new city called Nusantara, which okay. has been built from the ground up. Really? Okay. It's 300 kilometers away from Jakarta, and they've started the, uh, the, the building of the city already. And that is purely to ease the congestion in Jakarta by moving all the administrative government administrative offices away from Jakarta. Okay. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the official role of the <coughs> Honorary Consul General. 
As, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, mm-hmm. the role of the Honorary Consul is to represent the, uh, the country of Indonesia in South Africa, the president in, 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 in South Africa, and primarily to build the trade and cultural and political relationship between uh, primarily KZN and Indonesia through the office of the ambassador and the embassy in Pretoria. Okay. Um, you told us a little bit about Indonesia, um, as you said, and... Statistically speaking now, we said recent figures uh, from Statistics Indonesia show that the GDP grew by 5.03% in the first quarter of 2023. Now, let's put that into perspective. 5.03% in GDP growth in the first quarter. We in South Africa, we're battling to get to 1%. So, obviously, Indonesia economy growing at a phenomenal rate. And 4.9% in the second quarter, so compared to the same period last year. In the current climate of economic global weakness, this is, I'm saying they're doing fairly well because even China is battling to reach these type of figures at the moment. So Indonesia uh, pre-COVID was uh, performing at between 6 and 7%. Uh, even in, uh, you know, in 2017, 2018, they were reaching the 8% growth figures. And the, the pandemic has all obviously slowed them down. But the post-pandemic recovery uh, the uh, the uh, increase in commodity prices ov- obviously benefited the the economy. Uh, the strategy of the of the government is on growing the export economy as well. So it creates a cushion for for Indonesia. If we look back into recent history, uh, we look at the 1998 uh, Southeast I- uh, Asia financial crisis, crisis yeah. which obviously we know started off by George Soros shorting uh, the Thailand baht and then. Uh, he found the weakness in the Thailand economy, shorted the bath, and, and the bath fell. And thereafter, he saw, found a similar kind of weakness in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and Singapore. And it cost uh, the Chinese a lot to stop the, the fall of the economy in Hong Kong. And that actually saved Southeast Asia. Indonesia was the fastest to recover, even though it had been the worst affected. Okay. So in 1998, bulk of Indonesia's uh, state-owned enterprises were collapsing. Uh, the uh, financial sector had totally collapsed. The uh, private sector, the, the stock market had totally collapsed. And it was a huge cost on the economy. So much so that right up to 2005, you saw a large number of projects that had been started off in uh, prior to the 1998 crisis still were were not were not moving forward the banks the, the government had actually had to rescue a lot of the banks and take on the debt of those banks so they they started a strategy of reviving the economy of opening up the economy and creating this resilience through driving the export market so indonesia the 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 bulk export of indonesia comes from obviously the petroleum industry crude oil natural gas uh, through coal the export of coal briquettes and the export of uh, palm oil but it also exports a large number of vehicles and it's now diversifying uh, into the manufacturing sector so you talk about clothing it's now one of the the largest growing textile sectors in the world um, the the um, the capacity of Indonesia in the textile industry is second to China today. Uh, that That's the extent of that industry. It's growing in leaps and bounds. Obviously, it's got the labor force to be able it to... It has the labor force. Now, if we look at the labor force, uh, they only have a 9.2% unemployment rate in, 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 in Indonesia. So imagine in a population of 280 million people, you've got a 9.8% unemployment rate compared to South Africa. We're sitting at a 37 to 40% unemployment rate. Correct, yeah. Now... And that, that's the official statistic. I mean, unofficially, it's, it's, more, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot more than that. But 42% of Indonesia's employment is actually in the services sector. Okay. So the services sector is what's contributing. And when we talk about, in, uh, talk about the services sector, it's also in terms of the, the BPO, the business process and outsourcing sector, uh, the call centers, uh, around all the service industries. And if we look at... The innovativeness of Indonesians, you know, uh, uh, one of the interesting facts that I've picked up is that Jakarta was the Twitter user capital of the world. There were more users on Twitter in Jakarta than anywhere else in the world. And they were not using it like you and I would use it just to, you know, 
uh, post some random uh, uh, information or to search for news or make a comment. They were actually using it for business purposes. So they were using Twitter as today how we use WhatsApp business. Uh, right. People were advertising their services on Twitter. So if you wanted a plumber, you went out on Twitter and said, I need a plumber in this area. And someone would respond and say, you know, there's, there's a plumber in this area. Innovativeness of them was that they moved. You know, we have Uber in, in, in various parts of the world. Uh, in Southeast Asia, they have, uh, they have a, uh, a similar uh, concept called Grab. And Grab in Indonesia was growing by leaps and bounds, But because of the of the traffic congestion, they actually moved Grab onto motorcycles. So you can Uber on a motorcycle. On a motorcycle, okay. And you find, you know, you pick up a motorcycle, a driver comes up to you, has a jacket, has a helmet, has all the safety requirements that you need, puts you in a motorbike, takes you to the traffic, and instead of sitting for two hours in traffic in a vehicle, you can get to your destination in a half hour. Wow, that's that's quite innovative. This is the innovative thinking, and that's the resilience that has been built into the economy. Well, and that's now amazed. when when you get there, you see the amount of motorbikes. It's unbelievable. I mean, this is rows and rows and rows anywhere. So and, and the thinking of the government officials is different as well. So when I went to, to Surabaya, uh, the city mayor is actually a female. Right. But if you go through that city, and you know we we're sitting in Durban, so the immediate thing is you compare cities with Durban. Right. In Surabaya. Um, there was no dirt on the road. Oh. The road is actually spick span. Uh, the the sidewalks all had painted flower pots on them, okay. uh, and lovely coloured you know painted flower pots, and not faded paint, but brightly painted flower pots. So you could see that there was t- uh, lo- a lot of uh, social care that was taken, civic care that was taken in the city itself. But uh, in just across from Surabaya is the island of Mindanao, and. Uh, it you know you have to cross the Mindanao Strait, Strait, which is about two kilometers or three kilometer waterway, to get to the island of Mindanao. And they had a large population living in Mindanao that were facing unemployment because they have to travel every day to come to Surabaya. Right. The governor decided that he would build a bridge across to link the two places because they have to take a ferry to build a bridge. And in building that bridge, would encourage businesses to set up on the island. Right. Natural, you know, the, the conventional way of, of, uh, of funding these is you put up a toll plaza on either end and you charge users for going through it and then you fund the, the, the building of this bridge and this road. In the first week, he decided that they're not going to open the toll plaza. They're actually now going to have it free. But they would encourage businesses to set up their factories in Mindanao and they would give them incentives and tax those businesses that are there. Okay. They actually recovered the cost of the bridge through those factories and the taxes that were being paid on those fa- by those factories in a period of three years. Whereas if they had used the, the toll, it would have taken them 20 years to recover it. Wow. Yeah, I wish we had... Conventional some, yeah. economics it doesn't work for them. Okay. They think differently. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you're picking up on all of this by your by your frequent travels to, to Indonesia and by visiting the various different islands and interacting with them. But yeah, interesting. I wish we could kind of take some of this and bring it back to our own country and apply some of it here. But I think also more importantly than anything else is, as you mentioned, is they have a work ethic. And that if that work, work ethic is correct, then the productivity will automatically be there. And the work ethic is such that, you know, they, they, they believe that what is on the table to be done today has to be finished today. It's not I'll leave it for tomorrow and I'll come back to it tomorrow or, you know, it's not my job to do it. They would make certain that they would get it done. Okay. We, we spoke a little bit earlier about palm oil as one of the main exports of Indonesia. But surely there's, there's others as well. I think you alluded to a few of them. But you just take us through some of them slowly because exports is what drives the economy most of the time and i know in south africa it's it's, it's mineral resources but uh, wh- what what besides palm oil what really drives the economy they they export a lot of crude petroleum products natural gas so uh, they have they have they, they have, have yeah. they have oil as well yes okay they have oil they have uh, coal which they export coal briquettes which is one of the major exports mm-hmm. uh, clothing is another major export as well um, they export a lot of finished products uh, paper, aluminium products, uh, 
Um, so interestingly, Indonesia buys paper pulp from South Africa, right. takes it to Indonesia, turns it into paper, and sends it back to South Africa. Uh, they buy aluminium ingots from us in South Africa, take it to Indonesia, turn it into aluminium pots, and send them back to South Africa. Um, so what they are doing is actually buying... Uh, so in terms of the exports, a lot of finished product is coming out, but the raw material that they're using for it has been bought from other countries. So they're adding value. They're adding value. Okay. Yeah, and I'm sure there must be incentives that the government is giving industry to, to do that. They do, plus they encourage people to come and set up in Indonesia. So one of the very interesting things that Indonesia has launched recently is a nomad visa. Uh, in Bali specifically. So for the island of Bali, they have launched a nomad visa. So if you are working for a tech company anywhere in the world, right. you can actually live in in Bali as long as you're earning your income from anywhere else in the world. So, you know, today with the remote working, you can work anywhere, anywhere in the world. And they're encouraging people to come to Bali, uh, to live in Bali. Now, you know, if you've been to Bali, and I'm certain that you have, you know, it's a beautiful island, lovely seaside, beautiful beaches, cost of living is not expensive, the people are very welcoming. Uh, you can, you know, you can rent a nice, decent place in, in Bali, uh, and it's not expensive. And if you're earning in U.S. dollars, you can live a very comfortable life. And you'd be working from there. Nobody would know where you're really of working course. from. As long as you, yeah. you, you're doing your piece of work. But what's happening is that that person that's living there on that nomad visa is actually spending uh, the money that they're earning from California or wherever. They're actually spending it in Indonesia. Well, yeah, so win-win for everybody. <coughs> um, the Indonesia Mi- Minister of Investment was in South Africa recently uh, on an official visit to meet with President Ramaphosa and the Minister of Trade and Industry. The purpose of this visit? Well, it was, number one, to increase the bilateral trade ties between Indonesia and South Africa. So if we look back uh, from uh, 1994 till 2008, South Africa was Indonesia's largest trading partner on the African continent. Uh, we were the, the biggest trader with Indonesia. So more, most of Indonesia's goods came to South Africa than anywhere else on Africa. Today, we are number four. Uh, and that is because Indonesia has grown into Africa. So they trade a lot with Nigeria. They trade a lot with uh, with the West, uh, with East Africa, Northeast Africa, and they trade a lot with Central Africa. So places like Ghana and the rest. Uh, so South Africa has kind of uh, fallen behind. Fallen behind. Yeah. And the minister was here to encourage uh, that trade to increase, both not not just on the imports from Indonesia, but also the exports to Indonesia. Okay. So one of the things that they, the uh, ministers committed to, uh, so the second thing that they were, there were a few things that they were here for. One was to in- increase the bilateral trade. The second was to look at Indonesian investment in renewable energy in South Africa. Okay. So if we look at Indonesia, Indonesia last year produced um, 5,000 terawatts of energy. Why? And they only consumed 3,000 terawatts of energy in Indonesia. Mm. They exported the rest to, to the, the surrounding areas. Now, they have a lot of expertise in, in renewable, and they were looking at how they can assist South Africa in energy generation through the renewable industry. So they've committed to some investment in, in South Africa in that instance. The third was a very interesting thing is that as a South African, you can go to Indonesia and you get visa on arrival. Okay, But Indonesians coming to South Africa have to apply for a visa and don't get a visa on arrival. So they have to go through the process of... So if you're living in one of those 17,000 islands, you have to go to the South African embassy in Jakarta to apply for your visa, which becomes a bit prohibitive for sending tourists down to South Africa. Now, if we look at it in terms of its practical sense, uh, 60,000 tourists from Indonesia went to Kenya last year. 60,000 60, tourists from Indonesia went to Kenya last year. On holiday. On holiday. Yeah. Purely because Kenya gives them visa on arrival. Okay. Now imagine we lost out on 60,000 uh, visitors to South Africa if we had been giving them visa on arrival. So that was one of the things that was so put is, on the is other. Is there some uh, process? Under well, they, they're currently discussing both with the uh, Department of Home Affairs and the Minister of Tourism to see how they can structure it. Uh, so the, that that's one of the areas. The second one was in terms of increasing the Uh, the exports from South Africa to Indonesia. So one of the areas that Indonesia is looking to buy goods from, and this is the opportunity for South African businesses, um, that they're looking at the agro-processing and agricultural products from South Africa. So things like... uh, <clears throat> like um, f- uh, fruits and vegetables, a lot of fruit from South Africa is now going to Indonesia. Um, uh, meat products are going from South Africa to Indonesia. So you remember, Indonesia imports a lot of its uh, of its dairy and meat products from places like Australia. 
and it's looking for alternate suppliers. And South Africa is one of those that it wants to encourage as an alternate supplier. Well, South so Africa the, would be a lower cost producer than Australia. Uh, yeah. We would, but do we have the capacity and the quantity that we are able to export? So, you know, when they talk about, you know, if you need to feed a nation of 280 million people, you need a lot, uh, of, food. You need a lot of food. Mm-hmm. And do we have the capacity to meet uh, the orders that they have? So there are opportunities for South African businesses. There's a huge opportunity for South African businesses, but we need to uh, understand the country and the and the business opportunities in the country by visiting Indonesia, um, and and through more frequent visits to Indonesia, you can build that relationship. We we need to start thinking beyond the South African borders for our businesses, and especially in the Muslim community, we have you know a number of large businesses that need to expand the global footprint, yeah. and they have the opportunity now setting up in Indonesia gives you entry not just into uh, into a uh, 280 million population consumer market, but it gives you an access to the entire Southeast Asia region. So you th- you're already moving to almost a 500 million consumer market. Yes. So, Ibrahim, in this respect, there's a trade expo taking place in, in Indonesia, and we've got a few minutes <coughs> left on the program that we can talk about this. It takes place in Jakarta on the 19th to the 23rd of October and this trade expo is in its 38th year. Uh, What is this trade expo all about? It's Indonesia's largest trade expo. So if you know, if you look at one of these uh, uh, expos that you know lots of us go to in China, it's on that scale. It's a large expo, and it has a diverse range of products across all industries. So whether you are talking about in the food industry, you're talking about in the clothing industry, in the arts and crafts, across all industries. Uh, being in its 38th year of existence means that it is it is a successful uh, expo. It's been there every year. For the last four years, they've had a virtual iteration of it because of COVID. <clears throat> last year, we had, or Indonesia had, a, a hybrid version. So you could start off on virtual and end up in Indonesia. So the reason they had that was instead of pitching up at the expo on, you know, cold and uh, now starting to meet with people and not knowing what products you wanted and spending a lot of time on research, you could actually meet the exhibitors two months prior to the exhibition. Okay. And then build a relationship, and when you get there, you are now on a face-to-face, and you can find other products, and you can sign the deals. So the expo itself becomes the the, the place where the deals are done, not where the information is gathered. Um, and the products are, are from all over Indonesia. So you know, we talk about whether it is from uh, Java, from Yogyakarta, from Jakarta, from anywhere across uh, uh, Sumatra, from anywhere across Indonesia, those products are coming to Jakarta. So it's a one place where you can do uh, your product shopping. Uh, it attracts a large number of visitors uh, from across the world. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a span of, as you put, uh, as you said, it's a span of five days. So there's a, there's a lot that to be taken in. You know, the, I was there, the first time I, I visited uh, this expo was in 2002. And I spent three days there, and I only got through one of the one of the exhibition halls. <laughs> <laughs> That's how yeah. huge it is. Yeah, I've been to some of these <clears throat> big ones in China. Believe mm. me, you can walk and walk and walk, yeah. and you can spend days there, and you still won't get through the whole expo. Exactly, it's massive. So I would I would imagine this to be on that type of, uh, of level. But yeah. then you kind of focus on the on the on the halls that the would be of interest you, and, the, yeah. and the products that yeah. would be of interest to you. So uh, you randomly would walk about and the same. And and from a South African perspective, how can South Africans participate in this expo? Well, they can contact, obviously, uh, here in Durban, they can contact the Minara Chamber officers. Uh, they can email through uh, to kzn at minara.org.za and get more information. Or they can contact the ITPC officers, that's the Indonesia Trade Promotion Center officers, which is up in Johannesburg. Right. And if they contact the Minara officers, they'll be given those details as well. Okay, so so are you kind of uh, hoping that there's a delegation from South Africa that would come out? <coughs> each, year, yeah. each year we take a delegation across. And, you know, we, we take a, a keen uh, buyers across. So, you know, if, if someone is really into business, not someone who is... Uh, just looking, you know, in the future to do a import or looking to get into business. You know, the the challenge is it's it's easy to go to an expo and you can go to the expo if you are uh, thinking in the future of, of, you know, you're just investigating products. But the challenge is 
that the costs of getting there, mm. uh, going and researching the products, and uh, sometimes becomes a bit discouraging to people. So I would rather that you know if someone is already into the import market, already has a line, or is in the in a field and knows that they want a particular product, those are the people that should be going through to this. Well, I think this would apply to exporters as well. They could yeah. you know get, get out there and build up the contacts as as well. Yes, so you know works both ways. Yeah. I think. Brian, lovely speaking to you. We've run out of time. It's 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 already 8 p.m. Um, the Honorary Consul General of Indonesia to KZN, Ibrahim Patel, lovely to have you here. Shukran, um, and inshallah, we wish uh, that the trade uh, with Indonesia from a South African perspective grows from strength to strength in both inshallah. directions. Inshallah. inshallah. Shukran, thanks for having me. Just uh, for our listeners again, the email address for Minara is kzn at minara, M-I-N-A-R-A dot org dot z-a kzn at minara.org.city. Okay, excellent, Ibrahim. Inshallah, we'll have you back in uh, in the studio at some time in the future wearing another cap because you wear so many caps. Uh, Inshallah. These days. So, but, well, lovely having you there. And with that, it's uh, wassalamu alaikum for another week. And Inshallah, we'll see you again next week, Monday, on the Minara Chamber of Co- Commerce Business Matters program on Radio Al-Ansar. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.